Narrative exposition, or simply just exposition. According to the Cambridge English Dictionary, a clear and full explanation of an idea or theory. It can also mean a show in which industrial goods, works of arts, etc. are shown to the public. When in relation to literature, it means the passages which explains where events take place, what happened before the story begins, and the background of the characters. Exposition is one of the key elements of a proper storytelling. Without exposition in any form, you don't have a proper story, and all you can give are just scenes. Not saying you can make a story without exposition, but when it comes to big budget movies, it is expected to have some sort of story. While books and novels can get away with wordy exposition since it describes every single detail for the reader's imagination, visual exposition like in movies is a bit trickier. Depending on its type, the narrative of the movie is based on how it's presented and what kind of genre the story is based upon. For example, fairy tale movies use a narrator to introduce the story and character. This narrator is either someone who takes the role of a reader or a character from the story itself narrating for us the audience. You know there's been a heap of legends and tall tales about Robin Hood, all different too. Well, we folks of the animal kingdom have our own version. It's the story of what really happened in Sherwood Forest. Detective and noir movies are famous for having the main character narrating the story from his point of view and filling it with what is known as purple prose. There was something fishy about that guy. Where was Billy? He couldn't afford Mexico. Wrong sandwich. And wrong herb tea. And my carob snack was all crumbly. Something was definitely wrong. Framing devices includes the main character explaining his story through something like a flashback sequence or in a setting like an interrogation. Where is Scott Lang? Well, see, that's complicated. Because when I first met Scotty, he was in a bad place. And I'm not talking about cell block D. His wife had just filed for divorce. And I was like, damn, homie, she dumped me when you're on lockup. No matter what kind of story, there's always a way to tell it. What is important is to know how to do it. Otherwise, it'll be out of place for the rest of the story, or it ends up making a confusing story. On the subject of narrators, some movies open with some form of narration to set up the story. Perhaps the most famous are the scroll openings from the Star Wars movies, which were referencing old serials that had the same recap intro. Other movies would have the main character narrating the opening and sometimes the ending. But one thing to note that with the exception of these two moments, the rest of the movie plays out normally without any form of narration or inner monologue. Who am I? You sure you want to know? The story of my life is not for the faint of heart. If somebody said it was a happy little tale, if somebody told you I was just your average ordinary guy not a care in the world, somebody lied. Whatever life holds in store for me, I will never forget these words. With great power comes great responsibility. This is my gift, my curse. In other movies, they use some form of framing device to have a character narrating or expositing the plot, but not really having it as narration, but some sort of diary writing, where you have characters making their audio logs telling the viewer indirectly of the episode's plot and the progress they go through. Tape recording is for George Lawrence, United World News, Chicago, USA. So, I lied. I cheated. I bribed men to cover the crimes of other men. Characters making video logs is also another way to have the character exposed to the viewer without making it awkward sounding. Okay, this is video log 12 times 21, 32. Do I have to do this now? Like, I really need to get some rack. No, now, when it's fresh. Another example is interrogation and psychiatry session scenes. You have movies starting with the main character getting questioned by someone and they get asked to start from the beginning. 
in which the character starts narrating the plot in the form of flashback or establishing their personality and giving an idea on what the movie is about. The movie is either one long flashback or this flashback is just a setup for the first and middle act and the rest of the movie plays normally. Bus to Washington, Why are you going to Washington DC? I'm going to meet the President of the United States. I have to say to him, my name is Khan and I'm not a terrorist. My father was, was basically a drone, like I've said, and you know, the guy flew away when I was just a lava. And my job, don't get me started on, because I, it really annoys me. I'm, I, I was not cut out to be a worker, I'll tell you right now. Other times, the narrator is totally unrelated to the characters of the movie. Sometimes, the narrator is just someone reciting a certain phrase or quote something in relation to the movie. The film which you are about to see is an account of the tragedy which befell a group of five youths. In particular, Sally Hardesty and her invalid brother Franklin. It is all the more tragic in that they were young. But had they lived very, very long lives, they could not have expected, nor would they have wished to see as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see that day. For them, an idyllic summer afternoon drive became a nightmare. The events of that day were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The newscaster also falls to this as they don't really take part in the events of the story, but they tell it as part of the news which serves in introducing the story to the viewer. Robocop, who is he? What is he? Where does he come from? He is OCP's newest soldier in their revolutionary crime management program. OCP spokesmen claim that the fearless machine has crooks on the run in Old Detroit. Today, kids at Lee Iacocca Elementary School got to meet in person what their parents only read about in comic books. Robo, excuse me, Robo, any special message for all the kids watching at home? Stay out of trouble. These days it's no secret that a lot of movies we know today are adaptations of previous works. Even those that we thought were original turn out to be adaptation of obscure books or short tales. But make no mistake, both short and long books require thoughtful planning in order to either expand or condense in order to fit a feature length movie. For short stories, you need to think on how to fill in the gaps, how to write your characters, and how to make it into one coherent story without making it feel padded with useless filler, if not a loose adaptation. Early video game adaptations went through the trouble of giving stories to games that barely had enough for 5 minutes short, let alone a movie, or even a TV series. Not to mention the game mechanics themselves that were too difficult to translate, like puzzles and item drops to normal story flow. Well, excuse me, princess. The Hobbit trilogy is infamous for expanding what was considered a bedtime story to three movies and made the story far longer than it needed to, especially when it was supposed to be two movies instead of three. Which might explain why part three was filled with long drawn shots of characters staring at the camera doing or saying nothing. But then you have the big books, books that expand for over 200 pages, wordy books that you need days to read them from start to finish. These are the big challenge to adapt as they contain a lot, and I mean a lot, of exposition and narration that can be tricky to adapt to visual media. Books can start with multiple chapters just to establish the setting before you get to meet a single character. They are so long that sometimes a movie actually starts with the third or fourth chapter because there's too much to cover and it's usually pointless in the grand scheme of things and can be abridged to give the basic idea. In the worlds before Monkey, primal chaos ray time, and the pure essences of heaven, the moisture of the earth, the powers of the sun and the moon, all worked upon a certain rock old as creation. Tathagata Buddha, the father Buddha, said, With our thoughts, we make the world. Elemental forces caused the egg to hatch. From it then came a stone monkey. The nature of monkey was irrepressible. You can have an entire page devoted to a single line of thought in a character's head, pondering what he feels or recollecting all his thoughts or memories from prior experience that when adapted to visual can go for about a second. These inner thoughts and monologues are some of the trickiest things to adapt depending on what kind of story or narrative style you use. 
For example, it works for a noir story like Sin City because that's the style everybody associates with these gritty detective stories. Somebody wanted you dead and you know it. So you hit the saloons, the bad places, looking for the biggest, meanest lug around, finding me. Well, I'm gonna find that son of a bitch that killed you, and I'm gonna give him the hard goodbye. But when you have a story that doesn't have any form of narration or inner monologues, having them without warning can be jarring and out of place because it didn't match the narrative style you're watching from the beginning. I never saw him again. Using an example from my personal experience, I'm a fan of the light novel series Spice and Wolf. I fell in love with the series and I thought the anime was really great. But the second season was not of my liking because the characters were acting too harsh towards each other. However, I saw these events in a different light after reading the novel and finding out how Holo and Lawrence were feeling during the time when they were having their disagreement that I wasn't a fan of from the anime. So in this case, inner monologuing was a key element in helping us understand how these characters felt like and how it can affect the way you look at a certain story. And this was a TV show by the way. Movies can have it a bit worse if done wrong. And it's not just the novels. Comic books are known for their narration in boxes surrounding the panels, inner monologue, and characters that need to expose it loudly to the reader on what they're doing or thinking. It has been referenced and parodied whenever a comic book parody is made. You sly dog! You got me monologuing! Unlike novels though, comic books are still a visual medium, and the reader can get an idea of what's going on without the need of much narration. Also, comics today don't do this as much as the past and they switch to showing the scenes instead of simply narrating everything. I strike two on my way down. Donatello takes out a third with his staff. Raph loves this stuff. He's not alone. Why is he narrating? Is he crazy? Hardcore crazy. I love these guys! Therefore, unless the book is split to multiple movies to cover the entire plot without losing crucial details, Expect to lose a lot of plot points and elements like minor scenes that don't go anywhere or minor characters that are too insignificant to be kept around can be removed due to time and pacing. The latest adaptation of Stephen King's It did the smart choice of splitting the book in half. Thanks to the narrative structure of the novel that covers two different time periods, the makers went the smart way of adapting a single time period making it one complete story with a clear ending. So even if chapter 2 wasn't going to happen, you can still have chapter 1 on its own as a standalone story. It was a risky move, but thankfully, the movie ended up a massive success that chapter 2 is coming and that will give us the complete adaptation instead of just half of Stephen King's story. Prior to this movie, you had Harry Potter, Twilight and The Hunger Games who decided to split their final books to two parts. But unlike it, these movies already had their universe and adaptation set and changed from their first books and therefore was kind of too late to add things that weren't covered before. Like Dobby, who they remembered was a supporting character in the previous books, yet kept ignoring him, thinking he wasn't important until it was too late. It's times like these that I think it's better to have TV adaptations of novels instead of movie adaptations. With TV shows, you have more freedom to choose what to adapt and not worry about slicing the book to pieces for just two hours and so. And unlike the 90s for example, the effects have grown a lot to reach the level of blockbuster movies like all the comic book TV shows we're having these days. A single episode is now worth half a movie, and if you have 13 episodes for a season, then you can cover an entire book. And yes, I am aware that sometimes TV can still mess it up by reformatting the plot to fit a single episode or changing other stuff due to budget reasons or unavailable actors. But in terms of adapting the book's content, I say the TV option is the better one. Game of Thrones is doing great from what I heard, but can you imagine if this series were movies instead? I don't think it'll be as popular as they are today. The Last Airbender is one of the worst movies ever made. However, Unlike most people who say it's bad solely for the odd casting choices or the mispronounced names, which by the way are the correct pronunciations basing it on years of watching anime in Japanese, thus being accustomed to how they pronounce names and words in Japanese, so you who say Naruto instead of Naruto, Harry instead of Harry, and those who for some reason still call this character Ryu instead of Ryo, you may sue me for saying Ang is the accurate way instead of Ang. It's bad for the way it told its story. 
It's a very condensed setting of 20, 25 minutes TV episodes. An adaptation of a visual medium not based on a previously made medium. Thus, the cartoon series is the real canon and the version everybody goes back to. All the character and world building has been done already at its full capacity. It was already shown to us. But with the limited runtime of the movie, they had to tell us instead of showing us and cutting all the form of character development and progress that we've been familiar with from watching the cartoon. That's where the movie fails. It failed to give us a good story. Now, if the movie was an original story not shown previously, then it might have had a chance to be better since it wouldn't have something to be compared to. And with this runtime, it'll be like your TV episode on a longer runtime. But that's not what the movie ended up like. And that's the real reason for its failure and making another mark in long history of bad live-action adaptations. The concept of recap movies isn't new to the anime world. Recap movies goes back to the 60s. Anime shows cut and re-edited for a movie format. Either a complete recap removing all unnecessary filler, keeping only the important parts, or they add new scenes exclusively for the movies. Either they replace older scenes to fit the new format, or to set up a new and original order of events never seen in the regular show or setting up an upcoming season. This practice is seen today as a cash grab, but back then, it made more sense to do since the video market wasn't as strong as it was later, and so why there were many OVAs or original video animation made and released instead of releasing entire shows on VHS. And when you have a long runner like say, Dragon Ball Z with over 200 episodes, releasing them all on VHS would be too expensive and would make a lot of storage issues. If owning an entire series is an ordeal, then these recap movies are the second best option. It's no secret that today's audience isn't the same as it used to be 20, 30, or 60 years ago. Unlike in the past when audience could just have simple fun, today's audience thinks they are smartasses who think being sarcastic and condescending to everyone on camera makes them funny and pointing out that skipping a scene of a character moving from point A to point E equals plot hole. Ding. I may be exaggerating, but sadly, it's the truth. The audience today focuses more on what they're not getting instead of what they're getting out of a movie. If something is confusing and they didn't address it or left it unanswered, then they use colorful terms such as bad writing, continuity error, ass pull, or the ever famous plot hole. Your story has more holes than a Michael Bay film. Even if the subject was common knowledge like blood transfusion. <laughs> but again, it all depends on what kind of story you're presenting. Sometimes, the charm of stories is within the mystery aspect. Some things are better left unexplained for the audience to interpret them the way they want, like the contents of the suitcase in Pulp Fiction. We still don't know what's in there to cause such effect on people, but we still enjoy speculating what it is. Fans of The Legend of Zelda enjoy speculating and analyzing the timeline, making their own theories with each game's placement. And when the official timeline was released, it still made more questions regarding the third Fallen Hero timeline, a timeline many are having problem with because it's based on a scenario that never happened, which is Link's death in Ocarina of Time. So this is an example of an explanation that did more bad than good. Well, excuse me, princess. The 1989 Batman movie is seen as one of the best Batman movies and one of the founders of modern comic book movies. But one thing many fans do agree upon is their dislike for giving the Joker a clear origin. For many, the Joker is one of the characters who are best known for their mysterious past. No one knows who he was or what made him the way he is, and giving the Joker a face and a name from before his transformation takes away one of his more charming aspects. It comes ironic that this movie was inspired by The Killing Joke, a comic that did give the Joker an origin story, but you later find out how pointless it was when the Joker says he prefers to have a multiple choice past. So there's a high chance the story presented in the comic wasn't even the correct version and it's all within the Joker's head and never happened the way he remembers it. That's not... No! No! He told me things, secret things he never told anyone! Was it his line about the abusive father? Or the one about the runaway mom? He's gained a lot of sympathy with that one. Stop it! You're making me confused! What was it he told that one parole officer? Oh yes. There was only one time I ever saw Dad really happy. He took me to the ice show when I was seven. Circus. 
He said it was the circus. He's got a million of them, Harley. Prequel movies can be guilty of this issue, and the Star Wars prequels are the most famous example of explaining what shouldn't be explained, namely the Force and the Midichlorians. Ignoring the fact that they're actually the connectors between a Force-sensitive person and the Force, thus making it like the power levels of Star Wars and not the Force itself. What are midichlorians? Midichlorians are a microscopic life form that resides within all living cells. They live inside me. Inside your cells, yes. And we are symbionts with them. Symbionts? Life forms living together for mutual advantage. Without the midichlorians, Life could not exist, and we would have no knowledge of the Force. They continually speak to us, telling us the will of the Force. Star Wars fans did not like it as it was a very clumsy way to explain how the Force works and made it more confusing and raised more questions on how it works instead of leaving it simply as space magic. It's like telling a Jew he can't be a rabbi because there's not enough Moses in his blood. It doesn't work that way. Or from another recent Star Wars example, the implication on who Anakin's real father was. Anakin's father was another long mystery of the Star Wars franchise with theories involving the Son of the Force. Which leads us to Marvel's Darth Vader number 25 where the implication we're getting is Palpatine being Anakin's real father all along. It's vague for your interpretation, but when you remember the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise and how he created life using the midichlorians and seeing Palpatine's face here. We can say Palpatine is the one who created Anakin in the new Disney canon. The fans had a field day with this. Another example of a prequel ruining the mystique of something with mysterious origin is Alien Covenant where they... Actually there's no need to explain it. Alien Covenant is garbage and I'm going to make an online petition to raise it from continuity. Move over George Lucas, Ridley Scott ruined his own creation far worse than what you did. And that's quite an achievement. And to throw anime fans a bone, Jiren from Dragon Ball Super. When he was first showcased, the fans went nuts over him. He was one of the coolest new characters of the series and quickly became a fan favorite from his cool demeanor to his powers and the struggle the characters are facing in order to take him down. Until his backstory was revealed and soon became a laughing stock by giving him a very generic backstory and a lame reason to be strong. There are things that don't need to be explained. Simple as that. Was it necessary to know the students of Hogwarts crap in the hallways and use their magic to make their business disappear because they didn't know the concept of toilets? It sounds like a thing from a parody article. Is JK Rowling taking the same drugs Frank Miller took in his career? God help us when One Piece reveals the meaning of the D or what One Piece treasure really is. Another recent example is Disney recently revealing that Loki was brainwashed by the Mind Stone all this time. That's right, Loki wasn't evil, he was just manipulated by something else. He wasn't himself when he invaded New York, he didn't do it out of things like greed, envy, or just to get attention. It was all thanks to a rock on the stick. All that character development throughout the movies, his art from Thor all the way to Infinity War, doesn't matter now because it wasn't real. I recognize the council has made a decision, but given that it's a stupid ass decision, I've elected to ignore it. And if movies not explaining enough, or prequels explaining the wrong things, you have movies that are nothing but exposition dumps. Endless talks explaining every single detail and every single backstory over everything else. Now if this was a detective kind of story, then it wouldn't be out of place because mystery movies need to explain things to make sense out of everything that happened. Any other kind of movies, like action based movies? It can be a bad thing if done wrong. People go to action movies for the action over everything else. Doesn't mean they can't enjoy the story or characters, but they need the right balance of expository talks and action to give a satisfying experience. Especially when the exposition given is tell, don't show. Once again, I use the Phantom Pain as an example of poorly placed tell, don't show exposition. Speaking of which, one of the major criticisms of Metal Gear Solid 4 Guns of the Patriots are the lengthy cutscenes that are so long and taking its time explaining every mystery that has been encountered in the previous games and revealing that it was all nanomachines. I was implanted with nanomachines, kept in a state of eternal sleep by JD and the proxy AI and Ocelot in order to fool the system 
use nanomachines and psychotherapy to transplant Liquid's personality onto his own. Again, another example of too much needless explaining. Why won't you die? Nanomachines, sir! It's like jokes. Everybody knows you don't explain them. I don't remember asking you a goddamn thing. As you know, these three words has been criticized for ages as a poor way to start your expository speech. Same goes to similar sounding phrases like, did you know, didn't you know, as you might be aware of, need I remind you, but of course you already know that, and so forth. It's usually a way to provide exposition when you don't have a narrator to explain the story and events. My rose is dead. My dream is dead. And these monstrous things should be at the bottom of the river. Along with me. When you have a narrator to explain the plot for you, it saves you from this issue, and the flow of the story goes normally without forcing someone to stop and exposit something to another random character. A fourth wall breaker narrator who either interacts with the characters or a character within the setting can be a little jarring, but again, depends on the style of your story. Everybody got that? One of the reasons for the negative view on the as you know narrative isn't as much as using the words themselves, but more on how they're implemented. From a narrative standpoint, the audience doesn't know what the discussion is about and the info dump is mainly targeted to them. But it comes around as silly and clunky from an in-universe point of view. Why are you telling your characters things they should know already? So, what is it? Remember that transwarp cell explosion? Remember that transwarp cell explosion? Okay, stupid question. Even without starting with these specific words, the idea of explaining things in detail to someone who should or already knew about the subject at hand is still silly sounding and makes the one who receives the info look stupid for not knowing it. Somebody sure knows how to get a deal. Most of the medical supplies here are from Umbrella. Umbrella? Don't you know? They're only the biggest taxpayers around here. They make most of these medicines right here, homegrown in Raccoon City. Sci-fi fans get this a lot in what is usually referred to as Technobabble. Because they deal with a lot of made-up science, the characters, namely the scientists, need to expose it to the rest of the characters of their latest scientific discovery or to give an explanation to a mysterious phenomenon they're facing or whatever invention they're using since these are things unfamiliar to the real world and therefore they give an explanation for us to understand. Utilizing the Energon cubes, I can modify my light cannon into a transport beam, amplifying the rays through this telescope. Don't tell us about it, just do it. If you're a fan of sports or game-based media, then you're probably familiar with characters explaining the game to each other, either spectators explaining the rules to someone unfamiliar to the game, or the contenders explaining their skills to each other as a way to teach the player, or in this case, the audience, how the game works. And now I'll activate the magic card cost down, which means that- Do you ever shut up? <sighs> I know what it means. Now you can summon your strongest monsters to the field more easily. Please, what do you take me for, some kind of a rookie? Some movies like Robocop are known for the new segments in between scenes where they lay down what is going on within the movie without making it sound like a force as you know moments except for the times where they make the character just happens to turn on the TV or listen to the radio the moment they air the latest news. And in Gotham last night, another robbery perpetrated by the city's green-suited menace, resulting in millions in diamonds stolen with no sign of Batman. While normally it's a clunky exposition method, there are subtle ways to make it work. Like in a school setting, when a teacher uses it, it is expected for the students to know the stuff they've been studying and so it comes off more naturally. In the course of your education, you have been taught to look for the right answer. But you also must know that in life, many times, the right answer is that there isn't one. 
In legal shows, it is often to have the characters explaining their case to the judge because it is needed to hear all sides and to determine the right from wrong. Twelve Angry Men, for example, can be considered one giant as you know movie, since the characters recap and explain everything they've heard from their trial, and it works here because not only we never saw anything from the trial itself, but also it's their job to analyze and determine the facts from the fancy to reach a unanimous verdict. And all what we have to go with is the juror's word in recounting what they noticed. Did the old man say he ran to the door? Ran? Walked? What's the difference? He got on, did he? I mean, he got there, didn't he? No, well, wait a well, second. He said he ran. At least I think he did. Now, look, I don't remember what he said, but I don't see how he could have run to the door. He said what? he went from his bedroom to the front door. Now, isn't that enough? Where was the bedroom? It was down the hall somewhere. I thought you remembered everything. Don't you remember that? No. In business correspondence, it is used to avoid insulting the recipient's intelligence especially when it's uncertain if they know the information at hand. And when it is used as a quick reminder, or if it's important, it works there as well. So even if you didn't feel like it, it's still partly for formality reasons. Well, as you probably know, over the last 36 to 40 months, the firm has begun packaging new MBS products that combine several different tranches of rating classification in one tradable security. This has been enormously profitable, as I imagine you noticed. I have. In the military, it is very important to remind everyone on the exact subject or operation and to make sure that everyone receives the exact same information without giving chance to second-hand word or mouth to give the wrong idea. Now, what do we know so far? We know that the enemy leader, classified by NDE-1, aka Megatron, is resting in peace at the bottom of the Laurentian Abyss, surrounded by SOSIS detection nets and a full-time submarine surveillance. We also know that the only remaining piece of your alien all-spark is locked in an electromagnetic vault here on one of the most secure naval bases in the world. Decepticons, we have located the shard. But there is a way to make it at least acceptable and not as jarring as it usually is. I did not realize that. Yeah. Russell, did you realize that? No, I did not realize that. The audience surrogate, as the name implies, is a character who represents the audience and interacts with this new world in their place, so we get to explore the movie through their eyes and is the one who gets to ask questions and getting answered to when it comes to the setting and how this world works, or commenting on the absurdity of what they're seeing like how the audience would react. Now oh, wait a second. If this guy is so powerful, then why doesn't he just invade us? One of the most famous examples is Watson from Sherlock Holmes. His role is mainly to give Holmes someone to talk to and explain the mysteries to instead of having Holmes talking to himself. Which was the same reason for including the companion in Doctor Who. They are there to have a similar role to Watson. Someone for the Doctor to talk and explain stuff to. Almost everything weird about the Doctor and his technology is explained because the companion asks him how it works. So, explain to me how this TARDIS is larger on the inside than the out. Hmm? Alright, I'll show you. It's because insides and outsides are not in the same dimension. Which box is larger? That one. Now which is larger? That one. But it looks smaller. Well, that's because it's further away. Exactly. If you could keep that, exactly that distance away, and have it here, the large one would fit inside a small one. One of the common forms of audience surrogates are human characters added to a cast of non-human characters. Transformers fans are familiar with this as almost every continuity, with the exception of Beast Era, included a cast of humans who form a connection to the Transformers and get to learn about their world for the audience to learn. I don't know who you are, but you saved our lives. We're Autobots. We're from Cybertron, a planet far from Earth. Another planet? That's awesome! Those who tried to harm you are called Decepticons. We must stop them before they destroy your world. Can we help? We are the only ones who can stop the Decepticons. But my son Spike and I know more about Earth than you do. Hmm, maybe you can help us. Hey, tell me more about Cybertron. What would you like to know? For one thing, why do you transform into cars and things? Simple. It's guys. Besides, it sure beats walking. Yeah, but... 
How do you do it? Spike here wants to know how we transform, Hound. Easy, like this. Incredible. Now watch this. Who's he? Nobody. He doesn't really exist, Spike. It's a hologram. <laughs> what other tricks can you do? Try this one, Spike. Now you see me? Now you don't. Hey, where'd Mirage go? Over here! Disappearing! That's the best disguise of all! A common misconception about the audience surrogate character is the idea that they must be everyday people in order to work as one since they are easier to relate to. While not an inaccurate description, it doesn't mean it had to be that way. An audience surrogate character can be in any shape or form as long as it plays the part in getting the required exposition done. For example, Harry Potter is an audience surrogate. We are introduced to the world of magic and wizardry through his eyes and experience and question the weird stuff along with him because he's as unfamiliar to it the same as us who watch the movies. Even though he is a wizard, which is fictional and no one can relate to that profession. All students must be equipped with one standard size two pewter cauldron and they bring, if they desire, either an owl, a cat or a toad. Can we find all this in London? See, Harry, you're famous. But why am I famous, Hagrid? All those people back there. How is it they know who I am? But Hagrid, how am I to pay for all this? I haven't any money. Uh, Hagrid? What exactly are these things? But Hagrid, there must be a mistake. This is platform nine and three quarters. There's no such thing. Is there? Could, could you tell me how to... How to get onto the platform? <laughs> Not to worry, dear. It's Ron's first time to Hogwarts as well. Now, all you've got to do is walk straight at the wall between platforms 9 and 10. Best do it at a bit of a run if you're nervous. Good luck. Jake Sully from Avatar is another character I see as an audio story. He is someone getting into a new world we're unfamiliar with, and we get to learn about it and experience it with him, yet he's not an everyday guy. He's a disabled space marine. Or like a vast majority of the Doctor's companions. It's easy to forget this, but his companions weren't restricted to modern day people as he was accompanied by people from the past, people from other planets, robots, and a shape-shifting penguin. I'm not making the last one up, Google it, Frobshire. Anyway, like I said, despite the Doctor having different companions of all kinds, they all had the same role. Ask the Doctor a question, and he explains it to them. On the other hand, you have characters like Winston from Ghostbusters. He's considered the average Joe of the group, but he doesn't work as an audience surrogate as much as the others. For one thing, his introduction in the movie was very late, so by the time he joins the team, all the necessary exposition from ghosts to how the equipment works was already shown and explained to us, so he didn't get the chance to ask how it all works, and by the time the real plot kicks in, all that's left to him is questioning the events equally the same as the rest of the team. You know, it's just occurred to me we really haven't had a completely successful test of this equipment. I blame myself. So do I. Yeah, no sense worrying about it now. Why worry? Each of us is wearing an unlicensed nuclear accelerator on his back. There's something very important I forgot to tell you. What? Don't cross the streams. Why? It would be bad. I'm fuzzy on the whole good-bad thing. What do you mean, bad? Try to imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Total protonic reversal. All right, that's bad. OK, all right, important safety tip. Thanks, Egon. I'm worried, Ray. It's getting crowded in there, and all my recent data points to something big on the horizon. What do you mean, the big? Well, let's say this Twinkie represents the normal amount of psychokinetic energy in the New York area. According to this morning sample, it would be a Twinkie 35 feet long, weighing approximately 600 pounds. <coughs> That's a big Twinkie. Hey, Ray, do you remember something in the Bible about the last days when the dead would rise from the grave? I remember Revelation 7:12. Every ancient religion has its own myth about the end of the world. Myth? Ray, has it ever occurred to you that maybe the reason we've been so busy lately is because the dead have been rising from the grave? When you have a character transported to a new universe that's completely unfamiliar, 
They usually turn to audience surrogates when they start to get familiar to the mysterious new world they jumped into, but it only works when they have someone to explain to them. Otherwise, it'll be just a regular explorer learning things on his own. I don't know where I am, or how I got here, and who those guys were that wanted to kill me. It means you're either a Zen master, or you carry something very special. This? It was in a pawn shop waiting for a man to pick it up and return it to its rightful owner. The characters in Digimon, for example, are audience surrogates because they don't know what the digital world is, and they learn about it by interacting with their Digimon partner. But the characters in Pokemon aren't because the world of Pokemon is their normal world, and so the exposition type they use is the As You Know type, which is also why Ash was seen as a very incompetent Pokemon trainer in the early days, because Pokemon training was common knowledge in his region, and he should know the basics like it's second nature. What happened? Where'd my new Krabby go? Ah! I don't see it anywhere! Where'd it go? Didn't you know that a trainer can only keep six Pokemon? Huh? Trainers can only have six Pokemon and the rest are transported. Yeah, but you can switch one Pokemon for another by pressing the white button inside your Pokedex. A popular form of audience surrogate is the character in certain video games. As the player, you play the character as you, the one who controls and makes all decisions the character does. Bonus points if the character was your own creation and is branching story based on your decisions. Perhaps the most infamous of them all was Raiden from Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty, as he was intended to represent the Metal Gear fans who wanted to be like Solid Snake and be in his shoes to the point of training via the simulation of the first Metal Gear Solid game and making them think they can be Solid Snake because they played the game. Alright Raiden, you've already covered infiltration in VR training. I've completed 300 missions in VR. I feel like some kind of legendary mercenary. But Metal Gear Solid 2 plays with this concept. Raiden, who is the player, thinks he can beat this new game because he was familiar with the first one and expects it to be the same. But then shocked to find out that this game, or events, do not match the simulation he got familiar with and needs to adapt to the new events and game mechanics in order to succeed the mission. The game reaches a point of humiliating Raiden and to some interpretations, insults the player himself by telling him to be himself and accept that Solid Snake is Solid Snake and the player won't be Solid Snake in his life. By the way, what is that? Dog tags. Never heard the name before. I'll pick my own name and my own life. I'll find something worth passing on. Though in hindsight, that point becomes ironic when you know how the Phantom Pain ended and Kojima's point for that conclusion. I should also note that author avatar character isn't the same as the audience surrogate. The audience surrogate is the character who takes the role of the viewer. The author avatar is a character used to project the author's point of view and opinions. We got a guy with things coming out of his hand, we got another guy who freezes stuff, and then there's a man who, as far as I can tell, is made out of electricity. I mean, how did he disappear like that? What is going on here? Who is this guy? Let's just think this through. There is a rational explanation for this. Here's a question. You are a writer, producer, or director assigned to work on an adaptation of a very popular source material with a long publication history and a huge fan base. How would you adapt it to the big screen? Do you make it faithful to the source material and fill it with nods and references only the fans would recognize? Doctor Strange. That's pretty good. But it's taken! I, I understood that reference. Or make it so simple and so basic to make it more accessible to the general audience. Oh, good God, that was awful. This is a movie about Dragon Ball. They can't even get the fighting right. Oh, man, we need Goku here immediately to save this movie. Hey, kid, do you know where Goku is? Someday, Goku. Oh! oh! That's not Goku. That's a Jonas Brothers reject. This is a huge risk to take since you don't know what the audience is looking for while at the same time, you want to please everyone to have enough butts on the seats. 
By taking a certain IP and dumbing it down so it's easier to follow may attract more audience and newcomers, but that would result in alienating the fans who wanted to see this adaptation before anyone else and feel more entitled to it more than anyone, and turning a unique work of art to another generic looking movie could be seen as an insult to them and to what they're fan of. Like that one time when they tried to make Harry Potter American because someone out there had the impression the United Kingdom was an exotic place not familiar to the Great Eagle Land. Bloody hell! Using Assassin's Creed as an example here. Unlike most video game movies, Assassin's Creed is an interesting case as it's not an adaptation of a certain game but it takes part in the same continuity as the game series. Because of this, it carries some nods and references to previous games and little things only the diehard fans would pick on or understand. But for the casual audience, they can get confused trying to understand what this movie is all about or why things go certain ways if they're not familiar to the franchise. The movie gives some explanations, but they're brief because they know their intended audience already know most of the basics and focus on moving the plot forward instead of wasting time on endless exposition to explain every single detail. But because of this, it ended up confusing and lackluster to many of the audience and thus, it wasn't received well by them and sure enough, was still considered another bad video game adaptation. What do you want from me? Your past. Listen to me carefully, Cal. You're about to enter the Animus. What you're about to see, hear and feel are the memories of someone who's been dead for 500 years. Personally, I like the movie fine. My main issue about it is the runtime, which I find a bit too short to flesh out everything needed for the story. Another movie that seemed like it was aimed at the fans instead of the general audience was 2009's TMNT. This is an odd movie as no one seems to know what continuity it follows. It's like a sequel to both the live action trilogy and the 2003 animated series, but it doesn't really fit either of those due to many glaring continuity issues not addressed within the movie itself. But one can agree that it is mainly aimed to the fans. For one thing, the opening narration is very brief and doesn't explain much about the turtles since their origin is well known at that point. Four turtles, four brothers, genetically reborn in the sewers of New York. Named after the great renaissance masters and trained as ninjas, they battled many creatures and foes before defeating their arch enemy, the Shredder. And you have certain characters or character backgrounds that weren't explained in the movie but familiar to the fans like who Karai is and the rivalry between Leo and Raph which were callbacks to the 2003 series and you have this trophy shelf filled with items from the previous movies. Since this movie wasn't clear if it's a sequel or not, those who go into it without any prior knowledge to the franchise or its extensive history can get easily lost in the plot and might even think there was another movie prior to it that they missed. It's one thing when the movie is a standalone or the first of a series, but when it's a sequel, things can get a bit more complicated because now you expect the audience to have prior knowledge of not just the original source material but also the first movie. Either a sequel that opens with a time skip that was filled by tie-in material outside the movie itself, or a sequel that directly picks from where the last movie ended. If you skip the previous movie, you won't be able to get into the new one. One thing The Dark Knight did right that while it is a sequel, it still works as a standalone movie without the need to watch Batman Begins since it doesn't reference it as much as you'd think from a sequel and mainly focuses on the events currently happening in the present time. Hell, some people did forget that Batman Begins was a movie before The Dark Knight, yet they were able to watch The Dark Knight fight without getting too lost in the plot. Sadly, it can't be said with the Marvel movies as they are continuity heavy and they've been running for a long time, they can be overwhelming to newcomers. I made the mistake of watching the first Avengers movie without seeing any of the previous Phase 1 movies and as you'd expect, I was lost in many plot threads, I was confused more than amazed. Age of Ultron was even guiltier of this, as it was seen by many to be more of a setup movie rather than a movie of its own. It focused more on building the future instead of working on the present. Extinction. Same issue with every movie that tried to set up their own universe in the first movie only to crash and burn before they get to write the sequel. And while on the subject of sequels, we have to bring this up and that is Fallen Kingdom. 
There is one issue that we could all agree about it, is the poorly placed exposition. This is a movie that not only made heavy references to the original Jurassic Park novel and other past movies, but it also left a lot of needed backstories and explanations in the viral marketing sites outside the movie, while making some poorly timed as you know moments for things we were already aware of and didn't need much explanation. John Alfred Hammond, the father of Jurassic Park, but of course you know that. So unless you are a diehard Jurassic fan, you probably wouldn't catch on to most of the plot because everything that needed to be explained is already mentioned elsewhere. And while we're at it, let's talk about supplementary material for a moment. Some movies choose to leave a good portion of their exposition outside the movie in order to avoid wasting the movie's time with pointless things and focused on current events. The extra content is usually provided in other places for the fans to check out, either on books, toy profiles, or viral websites. A casual moviegoer would ignore these materials and focus only on what the movie provides, with some saying they should not leave important things outside the movies and all of it should be included. And you know what? You're right! These important things should remain within the movie to make it more self-contained to get the full picture of the story. But here's the key word. IMPORTANT. If it wasn't important for the overall story, then there's no need to include it and waste valuable time to address it. But of course you know that. Back to Fallen Kingdom again. The biggest point of complaint regarding the plot and the plot hole everybody keeps bringing up is the status of Site B and why they don't go there. And while I did explain the reasons for not going there using what we know from the previous movies and the viral site, I failed to notice that it was addressed within the movie itself. It wasn't until a recent chat between Clayton Fiorti and Terradome 3000 where they note the reason being mentioned but not in a direct way. The first hint is within the news segment. Geologists now predict an extinction level event will kill off the last living dinosaurs on the planet. Last living dinosaurs on the planet? All the dinosaurs are on Isla Nublar? No dinosaurs in Isla Sorna? Barren Island. Since the disaster that shocked the world in 2015, the Masrani Corporation has paid out more than 800 million in damages to settle class action lawsuits brought by survivors. It's on. Hey, hey, turn it up. Turn it up. We'll take preventative action to protect the dinosaurs on Isla Nublar. After thorough deliberations, the committee has resolved not to recommend any legislative action regarding the de-extinct creatures on Isla Nublar. This is an act of God. And while, of course, we feel great sympathy for these animals, we cannot condone government involvement on what amounts to a privately owned venture. Government wouldn't be involved in rescuing the dinosaurs, saving them is illegal, Sorna is out of choice. As shown, the movie does provide hints and tells you that Nublar is the last remaining place for all living dinosaurs in the entire world and the government decided to not save them and even if the Maserani company decided to do something, the government won't let them following the 2015 incident and losses presents it. We cannot condone government involvement on what amounts to a privately owned venture. That's all what needed to explain the reason. But as discussed in the explanation part, the movie didn't directly explain it by addressing Sona by name and the result is audience thinking they forgot about it. The viral website addresses other problems, but in the grand scheme of things, most of it doesn't affect the movie and only those who ask for very specific details would want to know. Plus, it's a free and public website that you can browse anytime, unlike books where you have to pay money to get a specific piece of information which would be a dirty move and bad writing choice. And then, there are reboots. If telling a certain story once was an ordeal, try to tell it numerous times without making it too repetitive and look no further than Batman and Spider-Man. Uh, no. Out of all franchises, none have been rebooted or repeated as much as those two. The origin of Bruce Wayne and Peter Parker has been adapted, told, and referred so many times in comics, movies, and cartoons to the point it became common knowledge if not outright a parody of itself. It all started when I was bitten by a radioactive spike. Seriously? We're, we're doing the origin again? H haven't we gone through this already? Yes, we have, but that won't stop us. We've seen Thomas and Martha getting shot many times already. We've seen Uncle Ben getting killed more than necessary. So when Spider-Man was introduced to the MCU and didn't reference his origin or repeat the same things we've seen already, 
It was refreshing for its time to finally have a different take with the character instead of showing the spider bite and ankle bits death for the tenth time. Of course, that didn't stop other fans from complaining about not getting the same things we've been seeing all the time already, thinking it's a crucial part of the Spider-Man mythos that shouldn't be ignored like that. And how could you not use with great power comes great responsibility? Well, we had to make up for your movies saying it every 30 seconds, but in the freaking origin movie? Into the Spider-Verse took this issue and had fun with it. All right, let's do this one last time. My name is Peter Parker. I was bitten by a radioactive spider, and for 10 years, I've been the one and only Spider-Man. I'm pretty sure you know the rest. They know the origin of Peter Parker was already common knowledge and overdone, so in a clever way, they did reference the origin, but made it a side note instead of wasting the movie's runtime on another detailed retelling. With great power comes Don't great- Don't you dare finish that sentence. Don't do it. I'm sick of it. Now to wait and see if the Batman movie that may or may not come out can do the same thing and not remind us of Batman's origin for the 20th time. Oh shit, here we go again. But this brings another problem, and that is the assumption that everyone saw the older movies. If you've seen a movie and you didn't know it was a reboot, and it happened to be the kind to skim over the things the older version went with already, then there's a chance you'll miss something from watching the reboot alone. In the old days, there was a saying that goes like this, every comic is someone's first. Back then, comics were more of one-offs and contained to just one issue and weren't as serialized as comics goes today and were very easy to follow. You could pick any random issue and you wouldn't miss anything if you haven't read previous issues. Sadly, this doesn't work anymore because comics today are continuity heavy and contains many references to older events they even tell you to check out a certain issue for more details. Event comics suffer a lot of this because comic book companies had the smart idea to have more tie-ins in events and not include them within the trade paperbacks. And for movies to avoid repetition, they need to avoid the things they've done in past versions, but in doing so, they can alienate newcomers who didn't have any exposure to previous versions and in some way punish them for not watching them. Oh, you don't know this random guy who showed up in the 2013 version of Evil Dead? Should have watched the original first to know that because we're not telling you. To end this, if you are a writer, you need to figure out how do you want to present your story and what do you see important to tell or to keep secret. Decide what genre it fits and what style do you think suits it best. There is no one way or one answer on how to write your story, but there are many ways to make it work or fail, because if you can't tell your story properly, you don't have a story to tell. If you are an inspiring writer or currently studying to be one, I hope you learned something today. And if you have any notes or disagreements with me, then please do so in the comments down below. After all, I'm just a guy on the internet who never went to literature school, so there's a high chance all I said was pure horse crap and I don't know any better despite reading books or watching movies for my entire life to get an idea on storytelling. That's all for today, and I'll see you next time. Where do you get these guys?